As I'm making this video, it's been just over a week since WWDC. As you likely know by now, Apple introduced new features coming soon to the iPhone and all their other devices in a different way to normal. The first half of the keynote focused on regular updates, the kind of improvements we're used to seeing each year. The second half was their one more thing, dedicated last year to the Vision Pro. This year, the showstopper was artificial intelligence. You've probably already watched loads of videos with immediate reactions to the keynote. I wanted to take a bit more time to really consider what Apple presented and wait for the inevitable slow trickle of additional information before adding my voice to the conversation. So here you go. My thoughts on Apple intelligence one week on. One of the very first things Tim Cook said at the beginning of the AI segment was, at Apple, it's always been our goal to design powerful personal products that enrich people's lives by enabling them to do the things that matter most as simply and easily as possible. We've been using artificial intelligence and machine learning for years to help us further that goal. This is fantastic marketing speak, undoubtedly crafted by their PR team, but it's also true. Each time that you search for cheering in photos and get a bunch of videos with the sound of cheering, that's AI. Each time you take a photo on a bright sunny day and get a perfect balance of light and contrast, that's machine learning. Apple showcased Apple intelligence early on in the keynote without branding it as such. When they demonstrated the mail app's ability to automatically categorize your email, that's machine learning. When they showed how SmartScript will clean up your handwriting or complete math calculations in your handwriting, you get the idea. These improvements are all the kind that Apple has been adding to their devices each year. They didn't feel especially AI, just cool new features in the latest operating system. In the second half of the keynote, Apple unveiled the proper Apple intelligence, their interpretation of what OpenAI and Google are doing right now. We're getting a much smarter Siri. I mentioned in a recent video that due to Siri's original design, it couldn't be improved further without starting over behind the scenes, and that's what Apple is doing. You've probably heard that your Apple voice assistant is gonna be better this time around, and you might be skeptical, so let's break down what better actually means. First up, the new Siri should understand you significantly better and more consistently than the current one. Everyone who owns an iPhone and has used Siri has likely experienced frustration when it can't understand a simple command. If you're into tech like me, this is frustrating, but you persevere. If you're a regular iPhone user that just wants their phone to work, this isn't just frustrating, it's a technological turnoff. Apple knows that they have to get this part right, and I'm confident that they will. The technology behind the new Siri is light years ahead of what it is now, and Apple knows how important this part is. So you'll be able to fumble over your words, make mistakes, and change your mind, and new Siri should keep up with you. A crucial improvement is that this is going to run on device rather than in the cloud. We'll talk more about that in a moment, but this helps with communicating with your voice assistant because the computational cleverness is happening on your phone, not on a server. Currently, your iPhone listens for a wake phrase, which is processed on device. Once your phone identifies the wake phrase, it records your voice and sends the audio data to Apple-owned cloud servers for processing. The processing returns a command, which is sent back to your device. This happens quickly with a decent internet connection, but it collapses without data, rendering your voice assistant useless in those situations. In the new version, almost everything is gonna be handled on device, meaning offline functionality, quicker response times, and contextual awareness, what Apple is branding as personal context. This is one of the main selling points of Apple intelligence. ChatGPT, for example, knows very little about me. It knows what I've told it, which is extremely limited. So when I ask ChatGPT to help me create something, the response is similar to what you would get. With Apple, your device knows a staggering amount about you. My phone, for example, knows who my wife is, who my parents are, my kids, my dog and my dog's name and what she looks like. It knows where I spend my time, my trips over the last five years, my significant locations, the content of my emails. It can use that personal context to give me the correct answers, like a personal assistant who's been working with me for a decade. For instance, if I have a photo of my passport somewhere on my device, I could ask new Siri, what's my passport number? And it would quickly locate it, pull it from the image, convert it to text, and insert it into whatever form I'm filling out on my phone, all in seconds. I can already hear your comments about security and privacy. We'll get to that in just a second. The magic happens when these technologies work together. So in the keynote, the demonstrator asked what time her mum's flight was due in. Current Siri couldn't answer that. It wouldn't understand the question. 
the new Siri understands the question and pulls together multiple pieces of information to provide an answer. It knows who your mum is, accesses your communication, finds the flight number in an email conversation, then cross-references that with live flight data to give you an accurate and rapid answer. Siri does this through language models. ChatGPT is a large language model, LLM, and everything it does is cloud-based. This requires a data connection and can result in downtime when it's busy. When your data is sent to ChatGPT for processing, it is no longer your data. Apple devices running Apple Intelligence will use a small language model, an SLM, which handles most processing on device. For more complex tasks, your device will use Apple's custom large language model, Private Cloud Compute. Early rumors suggested that these are based on modified Apple Silicon, like an M2 Ultra chip, ensuring the same security and privacy as on-device processing. The goal is for the SLM and the LLM to handle almost all of your queries, but if more world knowledge is needed, you can submit your request to ChatGPT in partnership with OpenAI. The example used in the keynote was finding a recipe with items from your refrigerator. Your device will ask if you want to submit the request to ChatGPT, giving you the chance to opt out of sharing data. Apple ensures that any data shared is anonymous and makes it clear that responses may not be accurate. A side note, Apple is adding the ability to double tap at the bottom of your screen to type to Siri. There are times when you might want to use Siri's functionality without speaking out loud. While typing exists now, it requires enabling or disabling a setting, and I think I'll be using the typing functionality more than the voice, but we'll see. So I already mentioned in the video, Apple Intelligence is going to use a combination of an SLM, a small language model, and an LLM, a large language model, to work. But how does AI and the technologies like SLMs and LLMs actually work? That's what I've been exploring these past few weeks thanks to Brilliant, who are sponsoring today's video. Brilliant simplifies complex topics like large language models, math, data analysis, programming, and AI, helping you learn by doing. So when I was learning about LLMs, for example, the platform had me chatting with a large language model because learning by playing with concepts like this is believed to be six times more effective than learning simply by watching a video. And the great thing is Brilliant has thousands of lessons just like this across a wide range of topics. It helps build critical thinking skills through problem solving rather than mere memorization, allowing you to gain deeper knowledge and become a better thinker overall. And because of how convenient Brilliant is, you can learn at a pace and schedule that suits you. I've created my own daily learning habit with a spare five or 10 minutes every day, time that I probably would have spent doom scrolling anyway, so this feels like a much better use of my time. If this sounds good to you, you can enjoy everything that Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days by visiting brilliant.org slash properhonesttech or following the link in the description of this video, which also gets you a lifetime 20% off the premium account. So there's really no better time to join the more than 10 million existing members and take your knowledge to the next level. So besides Siri, Apple showed off other AI-driven features for the next generation of their operating systems. Much of this is similar to what OpenAI, Samsung, and Google have already shown. I was more impressed by the AI-powered features Apple discussed in the first half of the keynote, like math notes completing calculations and formulas on your iPad in your handwriting. But there are traditional generative AI features coming as well. There's a text editor to rewrite text concisely or more friendly, convert it into bullet points, or proofread it. The Genmoji function allows you to create custom emojis from a prompt, like a T-Rex in a tutu riding a surfboard. They also showed image features like converting hand-drawn sketches into polished images and removing people from photo backgrounds with a tap. All good stuff, all stuff you've probably already seen at this point. Like I mentioned, nothing in the AI side of the keynote particularly caught my attention as revolutionary or groundbreaking. The new city looks really good, but honestly, looks like the version of it we've all wanted and expected for years. So it doesn't seem like it's going to set the world on fire. It just looks like the Siri that we've been waiting for. In terms of the generative AI stuff, the ability to summarize text, rewrite text, sort your email inbox, and create basic images and emojis are all fun and useful features. But these are all things that have been done multiple times by different providers already. I initially scoffed when I heard that Apple was calling AI Apple intelligence instead of artificial intelligence. It felt like a very Apple thing to rebrand existing technology uniquely for themselves. People said Apple would never use the term AI and they've kind of proved those people right by renaming and redefining what AI is. But after a week to digest everything from the keynotes and dig into the features, I kind of get it now. 
In many ways, it was a marketing masterstroke by Apple. They've managed to attach their brand to AI while avoiding the negative connotations associated with artificial intelligence. AI is often portrayed negatively on TV, in the news and in movies. So it makes sense that if Apple were going to align with this technology, they do so in a way that avoids those negative connotations. By rebranding AI, they've cleverly achieved that goal. This is still AI, but it's friendly, safe, secure. Looking at how Apple has integrated this artificial intelligence, I understand why they call it Apple intelligence rather than artificial intelligence. Compared to ChatGPT, there is no denying that ChatGPT has greater world knowledge and creative ability. But ultimately, ChatGPT is an app. It's an app that you can download on your iPhone, your Mac, or your iPad, but everything that you do has to be within that app's confines. None of it is done at the operating system level. And that's the key difference here, I think. Apple intelligence is baked into the operating system of your iPhone. Wherever you see a flashing text cursor, the writing tools that Apple brings with Apple intelligence will be available. It doesn't matter if you're writing an email or an essay or a tweet, you'll have access to those same features directly on device. And in time, you'll learn them and they'll become second nature. You won't need to use ChatGPT and then copy and paste everything back. Additionally, no other AI service providers are doing this with the same level of security, privacy, and transparency as Apple. And I'm not saying this as an Apple fanboy, I'm stating a fact. Until someone shows me another AI provider with comparable transparency and user privacy focus, Apple stands alone. Someone commented on one of my videos asking if I was concerned about the security of Apple intelligence, saying that they'd been advised to switch to Samsung. When I questioned where they got their information, it came from a comment on X. A certain high-profile billionaire owner of X went on a bit of a tirade after the Apple keynote, claiming that the OpenAI partnership was essentially a Trojan horse for data access. Unless he provides proof, I haven't seen anything that makes me think that this is anything more than sour grapes from someone with an axe to grind. Apple has been transparent, allowing third parties to independently verify their claims regarding their private cloud compute. You can't really ask for more than that. By the way, if you're enjoying the content here, why not consider signing up for my free newsletter, The Proper Weekly. I discuss tech news from the week, share links to content that I've been enjoying, as well as a tip for an item in the Apple ecosystem. The newsletter goes out each Friday, it's completely free, and you can sign up via the link in the description of this video or by scanning the QR code that you can see on screen. So I think there's a lot to be excited about with Apple intelligence, but not everything is perfect. Initially, Apple implied that all the features that we saw during the keynote would be coming to all compatible devices in September of this year. However, that is not going to be the case. Information has started to trickle out since the keynote, indicating a phased rollout, with certain features available on day one and others becoming available over the next year. I don't think we're going to see a situation where we get a dump of features for iOS 18 and then nothing until iOS 19, which is what Apple usually do. Instead, it will likely be a rollout similar to what other AI providers do, in my opinion. So you won't be able to use everything that we saw in the keynote immediately on day one. Additionally, Apple intelligence will only be compatible with certain devices. The rule of thumb is that it needs to be Apple Silicon with a powerful enough neural engine to run the SLM on the device. Essentially, this means anything with an M chip inside of it and the iPhone 15 Pro and Pro Max, which have the A17 Pro chip. The same goes for the iPad. If you've bought an iPad Pro or an iPad Air in the last couple of years, your device is likely compatible. The iPhone will see a clear distinction between those who can use these features in September and those who can't, which is going to be really interesting in terms of the public perception of this. You would have needed to have purchased the most expensive Pro model of iPhone this year or buy any of the new iPhone 16s when they become available. This requires a device with at least the A17 Pro chip. The iPhone 16 Pro and Pro Max will likely come with the A18 Pro and if Apple follows their pattern, the iPhone 16 and 16 Max will get the A17 Pro chip, making them compatible. This strategy makes sense and seems to be the only way that Apple can manage processes in their devices without appearing overly money grabbing. Every new Apple device from now on has to be compatible with Apple intelligence, which should be straightforward for them. On the Mac, we're getting an M processor no matter what, and the iPad Pro and iPad Air now always come with an M processor. This just leaves the regular iPad and the iPad mini, which use older chips. Apple could update these with an A17 Pro or an M2 chip, or even an M1 chip to make them compatible. According to Apple, this is due to the speed and power of the neural engine on the chip. 
In theory, the iPhone 14 and 14 Pro Max could run Apple Intelligence, but the newer engine in the 15 Pro and 15 Pro Max phones is said to be twice as powerful as the one in the A16 Bionic chip, the one in the iPhone 14 Pro. Apple executives mentioned that the issue is ensuring the device can perform on-device tasks quickly and efficiently. Apple wants to ensure an amazing first impression with features like the new Siri, so they're focusing on silicon that can handle the task. And while this makes sense, there is, of course, a more cynical view. Apple may be seeing this as an opportunity to create a compelling reason for people to upgrade to brand new iPhones during a time when iPhone sales are dwindling. People are holding onto their devices longer due to the cost of living crisis and Apple needs frequent purchases to maintain hardware sales. A flashy new feature only available on the latest devices could be enough incentive for people considering an upgrade. It is certainly more compelling than the camera is a bit better or Notes opens a bit more quickly. I'm also excited to see how this will work on devices like the Apple Watch and the HomePod. Currently, the Siri functionality on these devices, especially the HomePod, is poor. My HomePod mini has been disconnected for nearly a year because it constantly interrupts me and gets requests wrong. Improved Siri on HomePod minis around the house could be an absolute game changer. However, there's another detail to consider. This rollout will be available in US English first. It will be available to the US market initially, similar to how Vision Pro was launched. For those outside the US, you should be able to enjoy these features by changing your device's language settings to US English. While this is inconvenient for someone who writes a lot in UK English, it is something I'm willing to live with to try these features on day one and create content for my channel. If your language isn't English, you'll have to wait longer to access these features. How long? Well, that probably depends on how much of a sales incentive Apple intelligence proves to be. If Apple sees a significant increase in sales in the US, they'll likely prioritize rolling it out to more languages and regions. Apple intelligence will undoubtedly be a major selling point for new iPhones for the next few years. It is telling that on Apple's US website, Apple intelligence is prominently featured, whereas here in the UK, it isn't even mentioned. Instead, the focus is on Vision Pro, which is coming to us next month. So to wrap up, I'm in two minds about how I feel regarding Apple intelligence. On one hand, nothing at the keynote blew me away like the OpenAI keynotes a month ago, where the technology felt bleeding edge and revolutionary. The difference between the two is the implementation, and that is a big deal, bigger than you might realize. For example, I use ChatGPT every day for my business. It helps me outline videos, proofread large passages of text that I dictate, and summarize large amounts of information into more readable text. But most of my friends and family either don't know what ChatGPT is, or they've heard of it, but they never use it. A recent study confirmed that most adults in the US are aware of ChatGPT, but don't use it. This is likely because it's a separate app requiring users to integrate it into their workflow themselves. Apple knows this. They understand that the best way to get people to use Apple intelligence is to make it as seamlessly integrated as possible. They need to bake it into the operating system and make it intuitive, something that you can use within the apps that you're already using, something that you can learn and become natural at. This way, you don't have to break your creative flow to use a separate app and then return to your work. That's where I think Apple potentially got this right. They are late to the artificial intelligence party, no doubt about it. Apple can talk about doing machine learning for years, but in terms of generative AI and AI as an assistant, they are the last major provider to turn up to the party. However, it is starting to feel like Apple has been fashionably late here, and they might be the last one standing when the lights turn on. One thing is for certain, I will be covering the beta in great detail when it lands, hopefully in September, alongside the new iOS 18. I'm fortunate that I've got several M-powered Macs and iPads along with a couple of iPhone 15 Pros, and I'll be picking up whatever Apple releases in September. So I'll have multiple devices to test this new software on, and I'll share my thoughts on how it performs across different devices. If that sounds interesting to you, do make sure that you're subscribed to the channel. What do you think about Apple intelligence? Are you looking forward to it? Are you thinking of upgrading one of your devices to make sure that you can access it in September of this year? Or are you not interested? If not, why not? Drop me a comment and let me know. And as ever, if you found this video useful, do please consider leaving me a like and subscribing to my channel for more content like this in the future. See you on the next video.